Um, welcome to Stationers Hall for this joint event with Gresham College. Um, for the Stationers, Gresham College is an Elizabethan foundation, only slightly younger than yourselves by 40 years, um, thanks to the munificence of Sir Thomas Gresham, financial advisor to four monarchs, international businessman, diplomat, spy, gun runner, and money launderer. So, um, all in all, a good all-round city chap. He established seven chairs in order to bring the new learning to the good citizens of London and endowed the college with the income from the, royal, the shops in the Royal Exchange in order to do so. The college, of course, has failed miserably to educate the good citizens of London, so he continued to spend his money on an annual basis. However, over 20,000 people a year attend Gresham College lectures, of which there are around about 150, and we are very lively on the internet with about one million downloads a year. Now, for the members of the college, the worshipful company of stationers and newspaper makers originated as a guild in 1403, became a livery company in 1557 at the behest of Queen Mary and King Philip of Spain, which makes us a unique company in the livery flourishing today with around 800 members, um, representing both the traditional and modern wings of our trade, ranging from um, paper making and book binding through to digital media and 3D printing, which I look forward to finding out more about because I can't imagine how you do it. Um, the company is also involved heavily in charitable works, ranging from support for the Royal Marines uh, through to our planned Stationers Academy. Now, we join forces tonight to consider the question of Armageddon in cyberspace. The world is so heavily independent, sorry, dependent on the internet and electronic means of communication that thought must be given to the unthinkable. Um, first of all, how do we ever get by without all of our electronic bits and pieces? But what would happen, and some would say will happen, if cyberspace fills up, if it goes wrong on a temporary or permanent basis, and, of course, in these difficult times, what happens if it is threatened and how can we protect ourselves both from the dangers that we know and, of course, the ones that we uh, don't yet realise could be coming. Of course, there always have been problems with clerical records and misfiling and the like. Um, I've had fun in my time both with my bank and the local surgery where there have been two T.J. Connells, both of, one of whom was a Timothy and one of whom had my middle name of John. And Lloyd's Bank covered itself in glory because they put incoming money into my account, <laughs> to which I had no objection whatsoever, but the other T.J. Connell had no sense of humour and objected, <laughs> objected to my mortgage being paid from his account. So there we are. Um, it just goes to show that um, although things may be highly reliable, we can never be absolutely sure that they are infallible. And of course, we have had some harsh experience with regard to what happens when money stops coming out of the wall. And, of course, sat-nav is a possible case in point. I'm assured that it's accurate down to 10 yards. But what would happen if, by some unpleasant chance, not that it went wrong, but it went a bit wonky? Let's say it was out by 400 yards. To give you an example, um, Australia is about 10,500 miles away, and a quick mental calculation will tell you that this is 18,480,000 yards. Now, 400 yards out is an error of 0.00216%, which you will imagine is a negligible factor, until you realise that the M4 is 400 yards away from the main runway at Heathrow. <laughs> now, um, the, uh, I wouldn't applause because I have it on good authority that the ultimate disaster scenario for the emergency services in London is a jumbo jet hitting the M4 in the fog in the morning in the rush hour. And if on the way home you'd like to think you are the person in charge to sort that one out, I think you might well have nightmares. Now, um, there are also other things. The Oklahoma um, tornado shows us that natural forces are at work over which we have no control. What about electrical storms, solar flares, or sunspots, particularly happening at um, inconvenient moments? What about RBS, NatWest, and Ulster Bank customers who found out what happened when an app went wrong, software was loaded up wrongly, and it cost the bank £175 million for an error which actually was rectified in only a few days? Could there be a more innocent scenario, um, ranging from the retirement of Sir Alex Ferguson, 
Six million tweets in 24 hours. What about the latest Lady Gaga video? She is the first person apparently to achieve one billion hits on the, uh, or whatever she appears on. I hasten to add, <laughs> the master assures me that there are an awful lot of them, but uh, this is not a field in which I claim any expertise. Um, might we even have to go for a two or three tier system? A citizen's ban for all the phone messages and nonsense we send round to each other every day. Um, a second layer, perhaps for commercial purposes, charged at enormous rates, of course. A third level for the emergency services. What happens if you can't get through for an ambulance? What happens if, you know, the police can't use their networks because cyberspace is actually filled up? Um, and it's all happened so quickly. 25 years ago, um, at City University, we installed our first fax machine. Somebody is nodding because the whole university had one, which was in a cupboard next to the vice chancellor's office, and you had to go through a complicated rigmarole to use a damn thing. Within a couple of years, every department, of course, had one, and I can claim credit. This is the one high point of my career. I was the first person at City University to put my email address on my headed notepaper. And there was a complaint from the print room because it actually contravened the university's print, standard print policy, but there we are. Um, now, then, of course, President Clinton began talking about the superhighway. We all went along to courses on computing for the frankly terrified. But it's curious because there is a very long history to all of this. The first patent for a recognisable fax machine was taken out in 1846. There was a thing called the teleautograph, whereby autographs could be transmitted telegraphically to make sure that a document was genuine as early as 1888. Xerox introduced long-distance xerography. Do you remember that? 1964. So the development of what we now look at as intermediate technology has taken an awful long way to get there. What frightens me is where we are with the latest technology in 20 years' time. Now, today we have an expert panel who are going to tell us quite what will happen. Um, we have the combined intellectual firepower of Gresham College and the Stationers Company, um, who will provide us with a whole pool of new ideas to take away. But whether we come up with any concrete solutions before the drinks are served, I rather doubt, though I'm sure we'll have some extremely good ideas after we've had a glass or two. Um, so I am delighted to introduce Ben Hammersley. Um, he has so many credits to his name, I would refer you to, to the program, but the key thing is his um, expertise in writing a consultancy on the internet uh, in society. He is a senior fellow at the Royal College of Defence Studies in London, a member of the European Commission High Level Group on Media Freedom, plus a lot of interesting things besides. Ben.